Lewis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, we've just chatted off air that we connected first in 2020. Yeah, I noticed yeah. that we've talked about doing a podcast and I think that was probably when we were doing the one, you know, beer podcast. And at that point, I, I think just around then I, I'd, I'd left one, you know, beer to go on a slightly different adventure. And then we reconnected just recently. And what was lovely about that, I, I was telling you that I thought this is perfect. And it was genuinely perfect timing because I was just about to reset my podcast going series three and really get out there and inter interview some interesting people. And I thought, oh, this is perfect. Lewis has got this story that I know about background in someone that had a real big and bad relationship with alcohol and has spun that around into something beautiful and new and then in between making that arrangement i turn on netflix and there's this <laughs> big show on there the psychopath life coach and my heart sank i was like oh no what's that going to be about and then of course yeah. i turn it on and who do i see it's like i'm like there's lewis yeah. there he is yeah oh. A I've had a few messages from a few people that weren't expecting that, that's for sure. <laughs> no, and that's what I'm saying, because I know you, even your Instagram wasn't always the Psychopath Life Coach. It's it's all evolved and changed. That's where we're going to get to, mm -hmm. by the way. But I thought what would be really nice, uh, now we are reconnected, is to sort of start at the beginning, your story. And you know my story mm. is very much one of being alcohol-free and, and trying to transform the world's relationship with alcohol for all these different initiatives. I'm involved in for those people that don't know you. And I think most people are beginning to get to know you now, which is pretty cool, especially after your Netflix uh -huh. fame. Maybe we could just start with your story and how that unfolded. Yeah, so I grew up in a kind of emotion. It's harsh, it's harsh to say, but it's true. Emotionless family household. Um, practically, my family provided for me. You know, they would send me to school if I wanted to do any sorts of classes they'd do it for me. You know, they'd provide that for me and give me presents for Christmas. Everything was there. But... There wasn't many I love yous or hugs or, you know, and and, and no real emotional, well, no emotional intelligence. So never learned to express my emotions, never saw any other emotions in my household other than anger. Um, so no crying, uh, and no sympathy or empathy or, or any of those things. So I didn't even really knew, knew they existed. I just knew anger and rage when my dad had had a bit too much to drink and, well, was it partly the drink? I don't know if it was the drink, but he was an alcoholic. So my dad was an alcoholic. He would drink a bottle of vodka and, you know, two bottles of wine and four beers every single night. He would start drinking at 7 p.m. and that was his thing. So, you know, so he said, oh, I'd never drink before 7 p.m. And that sort of, sort of meant it was all right. But he was drinking like that for as long as I'd known him for, sort of for 30 years or whatever. Well, I hadn't known him that long. I knew him for 21 years, but I think he'd been drinking way long before then. And uh, he eventually died of pancreatic cancer, which was a result of the alcohol oh. abuse. But anyway, he, he was an alcoholic and he was abusive. Whether or not he would have been like that sober, I don't know, because he, he was always kind of drunk when we had those arguments. But um, he would call me a buffoon. He'd say you'd never amount to anything. He'd call me stupid. He'd refer to my brother as the intelligent one and say, why can't you be funny like your brother? And he said these things often enough for me to remember them, you know, and it, it really shaped the way that I saw myself and I wanted to be loved by my dad. I, I kind of must have thought my mum loved me, but didn't really feel it because she wasn't showing it in a way that I could understand it, whether or not that was due to my ge own genetic makeup or whether that was due to the fact that she wasn't displaying it enough. I don't know. And my dad just out and out looked like he didn't like me at all. So I was left quite confused thinking, I don't know if I was cognitively thinking I want to be loved, but yeah. I needed something I wasn't getting. So I, did the typical, I'm going to find this somewhere else. And it first led me on a um, productive path where I went to, I got into acting, singing and dancing. Um, you see the documentary, I even got into ballet and tap dancing at one point. Yeah. I'm just very extreme in everything that I do. You know, I'm like, well, if I'm going to be dan going and dancing, I'll, I'll do ballet. Um, give me those tap dancing shoes yeah. and we'll give it a go. Because I like to be on stage, I like to be attention, I like the significance that I felt. That was kind of the closest thing that I could feel to love, I think, significance. And then I was sexually abused by one of the guys at, at the stage school, and that derailed that. And that was when I was about 11 years old. Uh, and that was when I entered secondary school. And then I was left with another sort of void to fill. Um, so I started to be the naughty kid and the bad kid. And that was partially because I thought it was that kid because everything in my life seemed to point towards that. Um, so I started to become really naughty, was expelled from school, had an ASBO at 14, used to smash windows, light fires, steal things. Um, 
and was just very, very, I guess, yeah, naughty is probably the only way you can put it. And yeah, by the time I was 18, I was in a young offenders institution. So that's, there's more to it, but I think that's enough. Yeah, that is. Let you get a word in. (laughs) And then even having watched the documentary now, because I didn't know that was in your story, the start of the documentary is so graphic. You know, it's hard, isn't it? Like it's hard mm. to watch in that in that way. You can see there was that moment, as you said, that that abuse that that you suffered, which I if, I felt really sad around that point because it felt like you were about to channel your energy into something really productive, which was acting and singing and mm. dancing. And then you have this pivotal moment that then led you on this different path. So all of that mm. that energy that you had was clearly directed in a path that wasn't serving you and, and then you're getting yourself into trouble and all the asbos and all of those type of things, which again, growing up in East London, for example, there was always those kids in and around mm-hmm. the school, right? The same sort of thing that I think their their energy being channeled somewhere else. And mm. the documentary, what I noticed from it, that those early stages were really mapped out because of your ability to be able to go back and find a lot of that that information be it photos or even videos Mm -hmm. which i guess is quite a new thing because again i just about dodged that world right so nothing (laughs) my my childhood is not recorded at all whereas yours was what was the the thinking around that that to go back and really share it and be really graphic and open and honest well it was only when i mean we'll have to skip forward a little bit but I, i i went to rehab for six months and one of the exercises in the rehab center was to share your story and I didn't know what my story was. It was a blank piece of paper at that point. I knew a few things had happened. I had to kind of piece it together, especially in chronological order. And as I would do that, more things would come out. And and I started to piece it together and I'd write and write and I realized that this, you know, these pages were becoming longer and longer. And uh, I went into this group therapy session and the exercise is to share your story, I guess, to kind of release it and to connect with other people and, yeah, all sorts of power that comes from sharing your story, as I now know, but I didn't know at the time. And I think to bring awareness to it as well and break myself out of denial. But I shared my story and I was kind of expecting people to go, but oh, what? What the fuck is this guy doing in rehab? Because that's the sort of belief I had. I don't know. I don't know the problem. I didn't have to be here, you know. Sometimes I thought it did, sometimes I thought it didn't. Sometimes I think I could do it better on my own, whatever. All these thoughts would always sabotage my life. But I shared my story and I kind of expected them to say, yeah, cool, whatever, but their jaws had hit the ground, you know, and it, it yeah. made me realise, oh, shit, I'm, like, I'm traumatised. It kind of hit me. I, I, there has been trauma. This is this is significant uh, because these are, you know, heroin, crack addicts, all sorts of things, difficult things that have happened to these people beyond imagine, but yet they were shocked by my story. So that was the first time I shared it, but then I got people after coming up and talking to me about it and you know, relating and connecting and I felt good about it. And there was a light that had been, you know, lift a load that had been lifted. Um, And it wasn't until later on that I started doing Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and sharing in those and Narcotics Anonymous meetings as well, sharing in those. And then later on in the online world, started sharing it online, then the newspaper. I think it's just a progressive journey of sharing it more and more and more and more to the point where you become a bit desensitized to it. But you also realize it's a good thing. You also realize people don't judge you for it as much as you think, and they're inspired by it. And there's a lot of healing that comes with it, a lot of awareness. And I started to just get very, very comfortable sharing it to the point where the the Netflix documentary was the the, the top layer that I could possibly get this, this message across to people. And I've had hundreds and hundreds, if not now thousands of messages from people that have been like, wow, I've never seen someone share that, you know, in that deep, in that, in that detail and be so vulnerable and so honest but I've, but I've been through the exact same thing and what the crazy thing is I think a lot of people have been through similar things maybe not to the, to the extreme or maybe not all of them together but some of those things but they don't, don't talk about it they definitely don't write about it they definitely don't share videos about it um, but it's there and I think the more we communicate and the more we talk about these things the more normalized they can become and the more growth and healing we can we can do through it so I'm I'm hoping that I can keep on continually empowering people through that story. Yeah. And it is such a powerful story. And you make a really interesting point there because up until that moment, most of those type of stories you read about, and I'm a, you know, a big reader of books and I love biographies, autobiographies, and often those type of stories, those that were willing to share graphically live inside words on pages. Mm. Whereas your documentary is one of the first 
that I'd seen actually vividly and graphically through video as well mm. shows that story, which I think magnifies its power in many ways. And then here you are, like was, sharing the story. Yeah, because I think it, it, it was, I was one of the first, not one of the first ever, obviously, but I was a very early adopter of social media. So I was someone that would take photo, like videos on like the grainy old cameras that you couldn't really, then you had next to no storage on there before the days of the cloud and everything. But then I managed to keep on keeping those. Because I don't know why I used to keep them, but I, I don't know, maybe something in the back of my mind thought I'd want to know this one day. Because I've always thought there's something in me. I always knew there was something in me. I uh, didn't know what it was. So I don't know, I, I kind of kept those, maybe thinking one day I'll be using this. I don't know. But then it came to the days of the cloud. Then I started to store it. But yeah, I wasn't an early adopter of social media. And I think not social media, but just capturing video content and pictures and social media and stuff like that. Uh, because of that attention seeking thing that I had, I had this need of significance. So I used to upload pictures of injuries just to get the sympathy and stuff like that. And all the, oh, Lucy Lewis, you're crazy. And so I had all that kind of archive, but yeah, I guess I was kind of lucky that I was an early adopter and I, didn't, I wasn't ashamed of it to the point where I deleted it one day, which I think a lot of people do as well to try and wipe the slate clean. And it, yeah, ended up being great that I had that journey from start to finish all mapped out there. Yeah, we can see it, you know, in such a beautiful mm -hmm. way. And, you know, before we move into that transitional period, because we're yeah. starting to get there now, this uh, element of psychopathy or the psychopath, mm -hmm life coach yeah. was that a yeah. diagnosis i know in the in the movie there was the sort of celebrity psychologist yeah. sort of talking us through all of this was that an actual diagnosis you got at a younger age or mm. where does that live in the story yeah so i was i was starting so i went to prison when i was 18 and then after that i kind of created this belief system that another way to fill that void was going to be through fighting you know it was another addiction when I hit someone and I want to fight, I felt powerful, felt strong. Felt like, you know, I filled that void that I was been trying to fill my whole life with something. Um, so I became addicted to fighting, which is quite a rare one, but I really did. I'd look for it, you know, I'd want, I'd want that trouble. And I started getting into some really violent crimes. Um, I was, you know, I hit someone with a bottle, given a brain hemorrhage, I got done for like multiple GBHs, which is grievous bodily harm. And um, I was sent to a pre-sentence report of probation, which is a, an assessment where they evaluate your life circumstances and try and send um, the appropriate recommended sentence to the judge who's got a bit of background information on you. And I just didn't show any care or regard for anything that she was sharing with me. She said that, you know, she thought I was going to kill someone one day and she, she said she was going to recommend me for a, an indefinite public protection order, which was an IPP, which is the same... Uh, sentence that Charles Brunson got which he's still in prison for 50 years later luckily it's been abolished and I didn't get it but she actually recommended me for that um, that's how dangerous she thought I was it wasn't dangerous well no I was dangerous if we get it right but I was no gangster you know I was just this teenage yeah. skinny little kid but you know I was just very violent and it didn't match up so she sent me for a psychiatric assessment and I didn't and I just thought that was part of the, the pre-sentence report but it wasn't it was due to the way that I was reacting no empathy, no sympathy, no guilt, no remorse. Um, and he diagnosed me with that antisocial personality disorder, and I googled it, and it said psychopath, and that's the that's the label they put on that diagnosis. Psychopath isn't actually a, a clinical disorder; it's the label that they put on people with antisocial personality disorders. And you can have a antisocial personality disorder and, and not necessarily be a psychopath, um, because it's someone on the more extreme end of the spectrum. Um, but people do typically label it like that. So it's very stigmatized and it's got this very sensationalism sort of name attached to it. Um, people with antisocial personality disorders, you know, have the ability to be violent and to commit crimes and take risks and do all these crazy impulsive things. But some of them are actually also high functioning and you'd never know and they're, you know, in society and, you know, they're, they're, they're great people. They just don't really have much of an, an emotional response and they, they, they would be able to be violent if, you know, maybe, maybe they're in their military, maybe they're politicians, maybe they're CEOs of companies. They can make, they, they can make you know, high pressure decisions very easily without the influence of logic, uh, emotion, sorry, affecting that. But anyway, yeah, I was diagnosed from a young age um, and then 
you know, then I was <laughs> diagnosed with bipolar a couple of years later. And then I was also diagnosed with a uh, borderline personality disorder in prison. So three diagnoses. And then Jeff Beatty from the documentary said that he'd want to do a test on me as well. Um, and to be a psychopath, you have to score 30 out of 40 on a checklist. Um, and funny enough, I scored exactly 30. Is that right? So I'm right on the fucking borderline. <laughs> but those 10 make all the difference, right? Because those those 10 points yeah. are the ones where people want to cause harm to people and, you know, uh, liars, you know, compulsive liars and get thrills out of, you know, I have no thought whatsoever about hurting anybody or, you know, I did it because it was this need that was unmet. Um, and even if I have this kind of label, it doesn't necessarily mean I am one. It means I'm a, pro you know, I could be a product of my environment and my trauma has created this hard and conditioned shell that shows symptoms of psychopathy, you know, and there'll be many, there's many people with many opinions that I've received. Some people message me and they tell me that they're hundred percent guaranteed that I'm autistic. <laughs> Some people have told me that you are just a traumatized child that got sexually abused and just, just learned to cut off, shut off his emotions. And some people say, yeah, you are probably a bit of a psycho, but that's all right, as long as you're doing good in the world, you know? <laughs> so, and yeah. there are also people that say, you're just a fucking psycho that's going to take people's money and don't give a shit about anybody. So there's no real right or wrong answer to that because it's an opinion, really, and nobody really knows the answer, including myself, because <laughs> I, only, I only know me. It's difficult to compare me to anybody else. I can't compare my brain to yours. I don't know how you think compared to how I think. Um, I know that I'm different, but I don't know what that's due to. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a weird one, which is made, made good for a documentary, I guess. Oh, it does. And the name is just, wow, it, it stops you in your tracks. And I remember reading, I think it was John Bronson had a book called The, the Psychopath Test. And okay, in that yeah. book, he basically is saying many of the CEOs, many of our leaders yeah. are yeah. have these are on that spectrum. And they might be scoring yeah. similar scores because they have this ability to make decisions that other people can't make. They have the ability to be very firm in their actions because they're not as concerned about other people's emotions, for example. So it gives them almost in their business superpower. And like you say, these things can be channeled in one direction or the other. They can be I mean, channeled to something that's dangerous or something that's productive. I mean, you, yourself, you're a coach and you'll know that nine times out of 10, the person that's stopping themselves when they want to achieve something is themselves. And they know exactly what they want to do, but they don't do what they know. And when you really break it down, it's some form of emotion or limitation. It's fear or self-doubt or lack of confidence or imposter syndrome. Or, you know, and with psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder or someone that's low on the emotional spectrum, whatever it is, those kind of things are out of the way. So you just see it. For me, I just see a strategic set of, set of steps. And I've just got to keep them taking one step in front of the next. And, it, and there's nothing holding me back. It just feels so... Like without being too arrogant about it, it feels so easy. It feels so effortless. It's just there's 10 steps and I take 10 steps. Other people, they're constantly getting pushed back by these emotions. And what's interesting about uh, the, the sort of books you mentioned, I read one as well. It's called The Good Psychopath's Guide to Success. And it's about this kind of, I think he was in the military or something, and he was, you know, great at what he did because he could, I don't know, say, you know, win wars or whatever. Um, as you can see, I flipped scanned the book a little bit. I don't give you into too much detail, but something I found really fascinating was they did a brain scan of his brain. And um, they showed vivid sort of uh, violent pictures to people with a normal brain and people with a you know psychopath's brain. And normal people, obviously, they, oh, my God, and it spikes. What the fuck have I just seen? And you'd expect, I mean, what would you expect from a psychopath's brain, just out of curiosity? Yeah, you'd think that it'd it flatline a little bit. They wouldn't get that emotional reaction. Yeah, so actually, interestingly, it didn't just flatline, it dropped to become calmer. Wow. because they actually thrive under pressure and under stress and under like chaos and violence so that's maybe why some serial killers they, they, they do it for a release they do it for mm. you know it's because they can be serene and maybe in those scenarios which is absolutely bizarre but that's why some people in the military if they have got psychopathy they do very well because they're sitting there and they've got a sniper rifle in their hand uh, yeah. a rifle in their hand there's there's no nerves there's no shakiness and it's just a mission and it's just you know so yeah, absolutely bizarre. But um, I'm not quite on that end, but I've never had the brainwaves. So maybe one day I'll do a full scan and see what comes up. <laughs> and uh, when this, is the, this is the really interesting thing about the documentary and about your story as it unfolds. And you watch the first part of the documentary. And, and, and again, it's graphic as we described. And you don't know where it's going to go. I sort of knew because I know of you. But I can imagine mm -hmm. people watching that are waiting. Is this going to descend into some like horrific yeah. 
crash and burn scenario where actually you're going to use that diagnosis and you're going to go out and start doing these horrible things. But of course it doesn't like the, mm. the script is flipped beautifully and actually then evolves into this incredible sort of blossoming of your character, this transformation in the way that you're showing up in the world. And actually now you going out into the world through um, your brilliant coaching organization to really make a difference to people's lives, to, to show up and share and, shine and and i must admit that there was a real sense of relief when the story started to go that way as someone that's in the mm. coaching space and a friend of mine phoned me up and said have you seen this and i said yeah he said that guy i think that guy's a genius i think he's got it and he was sort of telling <laughs> me about how it unfolded for him that now you're spinning this story into so many different ways that are, are reaching people in different ways that maybe as you said have got that story that's a bit hidden in their life right it's, mm -hmm. it's the classic shadow work that people want to sweep under the carpet and wish others don't know and now you're shining this new light and owning that label in such a big way, which, you know, I can't quite work it out. I can't quite work out whether it's absolute genius and it's bringing <laughs> so many people into your world or it's going to confuse crazy. a lot of people. And I think that's yeah. probably why you're getting that mixed response, isn't it? Of people going, yeah. what? And, and well, I you... want it to... go on, carry on. Go on and, yeah. One, one bit to that and, and answer, are you going to keep that, that sort of definition of you or is it a temporary thing for, for what you're doing now? Well, I'll be honest, I put the psychopath life coach in my Instagram bio simply because I want people to be able to find me when they're searching for me. I, it's not that I identify with that label. I don't even identify with really? being a psychopath. I don't, it's not necessarily that I don't think I am one. I truly don't know if I am or not. Like I said, I can't, I'm not a psychiatrist and I, I don't know anyone else's brain. I know I'm different. I know I have traits. I know I score on that spectrum. I'm somewhere along there. Um, but I think a lot of us are. And I, you know, I, I'm not going to let, let that define me and that's not who I am, you know. Um, but the, the documentary, I, I kind of wanted it to be open because I wanted to spark that conversation. You know, neurodivergence is, is, a, is a big thing now. You know, diversity in itself is, is obviously huge. Um, but 80% of the prison population have personality disorders, for example. But they, but they don't know it. And, you know, they, they don't understand themselves and no one's speaking out for them. And they are this marginalized part of society that kind of keep on repeating the same behaviors just simply because they're trying to compare themselves to people without these personality disorders, potentially, which are different people with different genetic makeups, which function entirely differently. So you're comparing apples and oranges and that's not going to help. So I think there's so many conversations that can come out of this. Um, and... I, I want people to have that discussion. And if I said one way or the other, which I can't do anyway, to be honest, then it wouldn't spark that conversation. So I want people to be calling up people and going, you know, you know, which way is it? What do you think? Yeah. You know, because that's what's going to get the conversation flowing around it and bringing some awareness to it. Because, you know, psychopaths, which is, the, you know, right at the end of the spectrum, still make up 1% of the population. Think about how big of, 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 of yeah. that amount of people that actually is. And, and some of them thriving, but I should imagine a lot of them are struggling and uh, don't get the same help as other people with mental uh, disorders because of the stigma uh, attached to it. So um, maybe we'll get some more psychopaths coming out of the closet. <laughs> yeah, well, even if it, again, it just opens up the communication around neurodiversity, doesn't it? Whether that be yeah. ADHD or, it, but, you know, there's... Yeah. There's spectrums on top of spectrums, isn't there? But I think we're all so beautifully different. I think people that are open and honest yeah. to share these things can only be a good thing. And then so tell us a little bit about how it unfolds. You've gone through all this diagnosis. You've had this, you know, I guess, childhood into your teens, into your early 20s. You start sharing your story. You're sharing it more and more and more. And then you step into this new arena. How did that unfold, the, the coaching mm. side of what you do? So it was through... AA and NA meetings, Alcoholics yeah. Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. I did those and I saw all these transformative experiences for people. And I was blown away how simple it really was just to give someone a hug when you walk into a room and share a little bit about what's going on for you and, you know, connect and transform. So I thought, why can't this be available for people that are not drug addicts and alcoholics? Um, so that was where the, my, my first sort of idea for community um, was born um but i tried to get people interested and they weren't interested they didn't really have much clout behind me at that point i was riding a push bike in portsmouth and not long amount of prison and when i'm saying hey do you want to change your life they're, they're saying well it's not really from you <laughs> um 
so I, I met up with some people in Costa Coffee for free. So I reached out to them on, online, the ones that were sort of, you know, the typical moaning, desperate, upset, you know, moaning about everything. Nothing wrong with those people, but not not the people that were like really in pain, but the people that were kind of just a little bit miserable. I thought, let's see yeah. if I can ha- help you. And I sat down with these people in Costa Coffee. I even bought the coffee and I just helped them. And I just blurted out everything that I'd heard in rehab and all the meetings and the psychotherapy and everything that I'd learned. And not just my own experiences, but everyone else's through these rehab journeys. You know, the people that come in and out of pres- uh, rehab, sorry, for six months and, and the meetings is a big turntable of triggers, traumas, relapses, denials, breakthroughs. And I just absorbed it all. And I think created, you know, the world's best life coach training in my mind. Mm-hmm. So I was just spurting out these things to these people. I wasn't at that point of using tools and techniques and models and frameworks and asking the right questions. I was at the point of listening and then giving bits of advice. And I was getting great results and helping these people. And that's what kind of sparked the idea of, oh, maybe I could become a life coach after a bit of Googling. Built the life coaching business, made made some money. Thought, wow, this is brilliant. Continued to level up and grow, uh, invest in myself. And then went back to the idea of building the community. The community grew fast. Then it was just I was inclined uh, to always use social media. Like I said, I was an early adopter of social media and technology. My dad was actually an IT manager, bought me a computer when I was about four years old. All it had on it was paint. But, you know, I was, so I've, I've always been technologically inclined, but never used that part of me. Um, so all the skills kind of luckily married up. <laughs> you know, I was had this transformative experience that was kind of unique. And then I had this just uh, natural ability to use social media and the internet and marketing. And so so I started creating courses and funnels and ads and all that sort of stuff that we all know about. Uh, We're not all know about, but people in entrepreneurship know about. And uh, started changing hundreds and then thousands of lives. Crazy. (laughs) As simple as that. And obviously it takes a ton of energy, a ton of focus and character and personality, which years years of work as well. Yeah. And, and, you know, behind every overnight success is 10 years of hard work. Right. And I'm on eight years at the minute. So yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You're you're a great example of that. And suddenly lots of people will be watching Netflix and going, who is that guy? And they're connecting go, wow, it looks like it happened overnight. But as you say, you've been doing the graft and the learning behind it, building community, getting it wrong, getting it right. And before we sort of get a bit deeper into that, Obviously, through this period, you're still alcohol-free and drink and drug-free. That's your how you live your life. How do you feel that that's also impacted what you do and how you show up and, and shine through your work? Yeah. Well, that was the first thing I did when I was in prison, and I made the decision that I wanted to change. Um, I, I I looked at what was going to be the biggest thing that was going to stop me from changing, and it was the drink and the drugs. The moment I put a drink in me, I, I can't blame it all on the drink and drugs because I think I was an angry man and I think I had issues. But I think as soon as that alcohol went in me and that addictive sort of obsessive compulsive part of me came in, I would black out. All my trauma and anger would release. I had no inhibitions and I would just be on autopilot and it was someone else that would take over. So I knew that if I if I touched a drink or drug, it's game over. So the first bit of personal development I ever did was read the, the blue book, Phil's book, the, the Alcoholics Anonymous book. And I read that book and I was like, oh my God, it's like reading a book about my brain, you know, about mm-hmm. this addictive personality. Um, and I just related to it so much. And that was the first kind of connection I had with, oh, I'm not alone with this. You know, I'm not different entirely. I'm, there's a subsection of different people here. And um I then did this six-week rehabilitation of addictive prisoners trust program in prison, um, which was amazing. Learned loads. It was my first sort of introduction to personal development that where I actually noticed it work. And I was like, wow, this stuff works. <laughs> I can't believe it. I thought it was slowly rubbish. Um, and then they came in, uh, someone from the rehab came in and, and spoke about how there's an option to go to rehab after you finish prison. And I was thinking, well, I've already, you know, served my time in jail. I don't know if I want to be going and doing more time in, in rehab. But I was doing this maths and English test inside jail. And I punched a wall. Bizarre thing to do. Turns out I was scared of proving my dad right and him thinking I was stupid and a buffoon. Anyway, I went to the hospital because I don't actually have hospitals inside prison a lot of the time. And they took me in a taxi with prison officers and they drove right past where I went where where I lived 
And as I drove past where I lived, I just felt everything come back. It was like I just left yesterday and I just knew I was going to just go straight to my old power, straight to, into that pub and do the same thing over, over again. And I knew I need to get that rehab program. And it was torture. <laughs> they broke me down. They built me back up. I, I thought they were going to teach me how to not drink and not take drugs, but it was far more than that. It was learning about myself. It was working out why I felt the need to numb my, myself through drinking drugs and what I was escaping from and uncover all this trauma and unpack all this stuff from my subconscious so that I could feel it and express it and release it. And I just noticed my life just dramatically, suddenly, miraculously change. So I continued with it. And I just keep them taking, you know, one day at a time and got about six years sober. I did actually have, yeah, it was a relapse um, in the sense where I did the whole, oh, I'll see if I can, I think I'm okay now. <laughs> I'll give it a go. That old chest. was, yeah, which, which worked all right for a little bit and then got worse. And then I actually had a seizure because uh, I was, I had epileptic seizures before. I didn't put that in the documentary, but I was having epileptic seizures due to the alcohol. And um, I had a seizure and actually had a cardiac arrest and my, my, my fiance at the time actually had to resuscitate me. So it was like a, yeah, a big wake up call. And then, what even was it? I had a tattoo done and I had got an infection. At the same time, they prescribed me with, um, uh, what do they call them? Like benzos, like a drug. It's a diet. As, yeah. yeah. So I was, uh, so I just relapsed from drinking and they gave me these benzos and it just, it took it, I could feel it taking over me. Like I wanted to take like 10 of these tablets. Yeah. And I, wanted to just, I was like, fuck, I'm slipping, you know? So I just, you know, dropped it all back and went sober again. I think there was one more time where I did it again. I relapsed again. Again, it was, n- it was never a fuck it moment. It was never so yeah. bad happening. They say you've got to look out for your highs just as much as your lows. Um, and I've tried to, I'll be honest, because I don't like to, to, to lie about it. I have tried to flirt with it a few times to see, you know, am I different now? Can I do it just red wine? You know, can I have it just with a meal? And the truth of the matter is I can't. And, I, and I've tried and I really can't. Um, so I got six years sober, had a couple of blips and now I'm back to completely clean and sober. And it's, it's where my life is best. And I grow the fastest in this state. So I, I would like, I guess, to have that social drink, but the, the what I what I get from not having it is far far greater. You know, I'm married. I've got a baby. These things I wouldn't have if I was in active addiction and alcoholism like I, like I was before. Yeah, and I think the truth is as well, you wouldn't have achieved many of the things that you've gone on to achieve. And I think it's also it's great that you're open and honest about that because I think that's the story of most people, isn't it? I think there is a bit of experimentation, or there are moments when it doesn't work out. And I think it's being courageous enough to own those moments as an experiment or something that we try and then there's learning in there isn't there i think as long as you can you know learn from and grow stronger through the process i think it's when we build up too much shame around an event such as like that and then we disappear or we fall off the wagon mm-hmm. proverbially because it's that sense of i've got to sweep it under the carpet i'm embarrassed now whereas i think owning mm-hmm. it then you can bounce back there's something to learn from it and obviously that's mm-hmm. what you've got in your story and i think also being on the coaching adventure like your mind is trained so differently, isn't it? Because you're constantly teaching other people, coaching other people about these things, which ultimately I think that's been the biggest win for me really over the last 10 years is going alcohol free and then training as a coach. Because I think the combination of those two things, you just, your mind is so much quicker to see those things mm-hmm. when there's an error. So you can bounce back that bit quicker and get out there and do your thing in such a big way. And you mentioned there about your now married and mm-hmm. your dad. Yeah, How's that going for you? Oh, he's only three months old. Little Ocean, his name is yeah. Ocean, but the unique name, Ocean Enrique Taylor. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been an interesting one to be honest. I'm still adjusting to it. Um, whether or not it's this diagnosis or it's this hard show I've got or whatever it is, it's um, I think it's going to be a gradual bonding experience. Um, I was so pleased that I cried when he when he when he, when he was born though. Because I was worried that I wasn't going to. Because I thought, if I don't cry when he's born, then I am a psycho. <laughs> and, and as soon as he was born, I just burst out. And it was just automatic. Was like, God. Um, but my my wife seems to be, um, the only way I could say it, and not in a negative way, is um, lovingly obsessed with him. But that's, I don't, that's I'm not quite the same in that respect. I love him. He's amazing. 
Bagadors is putting down for a bit. <laughs> she got. So um, anyway, it's a, it's a new experience. I'm learning to bond and, and connect with another human being, just like any others, which has been difficult for me in my life. Um, but he's my life mission, you know, in, in terms of to create this bond and to, yeah. to break this generational kind of yeah. emotional trauma that, you know, I've experienced. You know, my mum didn't, my mum came from a background of not having that, that affection. And my dad uh, told me he didn't like his family and family are just people he told me that. So I'm the one that's going to break that. My wife is very loving. She's American. She's like, loves Christmas and loves Disney and she's yeah. like constantly positive and smiling. So yeah, I'd be lying if I was, if I was saying like, oh, the moment he was born, it was like uh, my, my floodgates opened. And although I did cry, I think it's going to be slower for me. Um, the most but i'm looking forward to a lifelong adventure of constantly you know becoming his dad more and more yeah and, and there's so many beautiful things in there like you say you become that circuit breaker don't you and that generational whether it's yeah. in your relationship with alcohol for example you demonstrate it's not a genetic thing and you can do something different and in your relationship with your son you then get a chance to break that circuit mm. as well and don't be too hard on yourself i don't think i cried when my daughter was born although i did run out into the waiting room because my wife's mum had flown over from ireland the labor was so long and her sister and i was convinced you know i'm one of three boys footballer i was so convinced i was having a boy i remember wow. running out as as our beautiful little girl was born and, and i said to the entire waiting room my boy's a girl <laughs> <laughs> that was my big announcement to everyone and i wow. think also okay. like the the mums, if that's your setup, spend a lot more time with those babies in those early days, you know? So it does take mm. the dad, especially when they're tiny like that, it, it takes you a little while to, to sort yeah. of warm up into it. So treat your, treat yourself kindly. But okay, also, that's good to hear. Yeah. Because <laughs> like I said, I don't know. I, I only know how my brain works. Yeah. So sometimes I worry it's not, it's not wired up properly. So yeah, I, I don't know how other people would react in this scenario. So I'm thinking, is this normal? Is this not normal? You know, I do sometimes question that. But um, it's good to hear. You sounded, no, really? I sounded more more empath empathic than than you in that scenario. Maybe I you're know. more of a psycho than me. <laughs> I might need to go and do this test in a minute. <laughs> Hopefully not. But we never know. But I tell you what, you're doing a blooming good job as it is. So let's let's continue the the story. Okay. So you get into this life coaching yourself. You then set yeah. up this incredible organization. Is it Coaching Masters? I'm going to check. I've got that the right. Coaching Masters. Yeah. The Coaching Masters. Yeah. Which then starts to train coaches mm -hmm. which i love because it's something that i'm really passionate about myself and i remember a bit in the documentary where there's the the sort of counter argument there's that one particular lady yeah. that's saying it's a bit cultish which is a really flippant thing i think to say about any organization you could look at yeah. any organization and you could throw those type of flippant comments around yeah. you know most of which there's there's no grounding there's no truth in that there's just a group of people coming together and they're getting great results and i think the counter argument was that you know, they're marketing to vulnerable people. And, and at times when we've been involved in the alcohol free space, we got a bit of that as well. You know, mm. in the early days of one, you know, beer. Well, they're the people that need help the most. <laughs> exactly. So I was watching that going, yeah, but they're missing the point because if yeah. there's lots of things in the world that take advantage of people, there's scammers that will, you know, scam thousands of pounds out of investors on an investment that just doesn't even exist. But when you look at something like coach training or training as a coach, that investment, in my opinion, will be one of the greatest investments you ever make. It's irrelevant yeah. whether you actually ever go and coach anyone because yeah. the self-development that anyone and everyone will get from that is so powerful. It's worth every penny. So if someone is going through something that's traumatic or they're overcoming a big life change and they come to, to, to yourself and they go on a coaching learning adventure, yeah. that for many people will be the greatest thing that they ever invest in in their 100%. life so i see the absolute you know opposite side of that so i was in ingredients with you. you all the time and, and i'm sure you see something similar of course yeah i mean I, I find it bizarre when people say that because i was once that vulnerable person and imagine if someone denied me that help and said i'm sorry you're too vulnerable we, we don't want to help you you know that's that's even more um harsh you know uh these people need help the most and just because you've been traumatized or you've had something significant happen in your life doesn't even mean you're vulnerable it could actually mean you're stronger than most and um, that's you know i talk a lot about turning adversity into an asset 
And you'll find that a lot of people that become a coach or get into that space is because they're genuinely passionate about it because they've had a personal experience with it and they've been through it and they've grown from it. And it's like, you know, without being too cliche, it's a bit like, you know, grown muscle, isn't it? You know, you have to burn that muscle down and then it rebuilds back stronger. And I think a lot of people that have been through these difficult times, they get a lot of resilience. They, 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 they become, they have a lot of grit about them and they're able to handle situations that other people can't because their threshold of difficult times is much more different is is a lot more different sorry than your average person so yes they are they have potentially had things happen to them and the reason why they come to us is because that's my story my business partner has a similar one of different adversities his dad committed suicide he uh, he was in the london terror attacks you know so between us we've had you know all these traumas and all these experiences but we're sending a message that says no matter what that doesn't matter. You can still do whatever you want with your life. And of course, what type of people is that going to attract? The people that resonate and connect with with that story. So there'll always be that. And um, the fact that you know, just a you know, just the account of the exact argument she gave, which was um, there's an algorithm set to target people that are bereaved. If you know, if you yourself have ever have run any ads, for example, you'll know that you can't even write certain words in ads, or even you know, do people's job professions or very stringent very strict you cannot target people that are vulnerable you cannot even target people with specific categories at all so it's just strange how people have this um where they want to drag people down you know um there's 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 very different reasons for it either they're hurt themselves they're jealous there's a bit of limelight that they want to steal um maybe they're so warped in their perspective that they genuinely believe it which sometimes i do think is true um there's a lot of people out there that think i'm a scammer there's probably people that think you're a scammer it's bizarre isn't it when you're going well i'm just trying to help people uh, but yet they still think it's some sort of pyramid scheme or something i'm like it's not a pyramid scheme <laughs> you know I, it's literally not a pyramid scheme um and even if it was a pyramid scheme some of those aren't even scams there's quite a lot of those out there you know that would be probably one of the yeah. best types of, <laughs> of scams you could get involved with um so yeah it's, it's crazy but um for every bit of hate there's so much good you know for every a little bit of darkness there's so much light so i'll always i'll always embrace it and take it in my stride even though it can throw it up a little bit sometimes because i just see all those thousands of messages and all all the people's lives have changed and i think you know what if i could put up with a bit of shit because of it then well worth it yeah and you're well able and i think exactly that then you shine your light it inspires other people and as you share your message, of course, as you said, you're going to interest and attract people with a similar story. That's how like great marketing works and how you actually get out and make a difference to so many people's lives. So maybe as we sort of drift towards, yeah, maybe tell us about some of the success stories of the people that have come to train with you now that are turning their life around. And then maybe yeah. tell us like where the business is going, which is exciting as yeah. well. I mean, you're, you're really growing this wonderful empire now. Yeah, so the only reason we did the the coaching training is because people were asking for it, and we didn't really expect it to be what it was. But we just threw our heart, life, and soul, and brain, and every everything we'd ever learned into it, as well as the tools and techniques. And people did it for twelve weeks. It was live on Zoom. That's all it was. It was no, we had no website. We had no nothing. It was just a Zoom live. And by the end of it, people were just blown away that they. And they change their lives. They change the way they think, their their perspective over the way that they act, their behavior is different, their their goals were different, the way they behave with their family were different. All these things were just completely different. And they were blown away. And they they said, I wasn't expecting that. I came here to learn some tools to be able to like charge 60 quid an hour or 400 quid an hour as a coach. I didn't know that I was going to change my life in 12 weeks. And I know that sounds from change your life in 12 weeks BS. But, uh, you know, if you get the right information at the right time oh, yeah. and you get one of those breakthroughs, sometimes it can happen in a second, let alone 12 weeks. And it compounds over that time. So we change those people's lives. And, yeah, I think our coaching accreditation is quite unique in a sense where it is a coach training, but it's it's also transformative personally. And we say become your first client, you know, apply all these tools and techniques to yourself, um, practice in our you know workshops and be coached coach other people and immerse yourself in it and by the end of it not only will your life will change but you'll also have a skill set that you can share with other people 
So that's kind of how we got into it. Um, we built virtual reality and a co-working space out in Bali because I was in Bali for three years and I just, there were so many coaches out there just because it's full of breath work and tantra and plant ceremonies, plant medicine ceremonies, and just crazy things in the jungle that you wouldn't believe. I don't know if you've ever been to Bali, but if you haven't, yeah. you yourself over there because it's a whole different world. And then um, it was just so many coaches out there. So I built a, a co-working and a, and a coach training center. So, and then it turned into a restaurant and we've got a second floor and, a, and and now it has everything from, you know, cocktails and breakfast, lunch and dinner and networking of nights and training, you know, from different digital nomads or coaches and things, delivering workshops and things. But that's just a, a small, well, it's not a small part, but that's just a sort of piece of the puzzle. We're sort of building out this ecosystem uh, for coaches and actually now looking to step outside of coaching into more sort of mainstream education. I personally believe the education system is broken. It's built off the industrial revolution designed to create workers. I don't want to get too sort of conspiracy theorists on it, but I don't think we're taught the right things to thrive. I definitely wasn't, you know, I don't think the photosynthesis and algebra is teaching anybody anything about life. And it's, you know, the world has evolved so fast that the education system that was created is no longer fit for the modern world. And I think they're trying to make changes, but they're so marginal, they're just irrelevant. So there, there's some disruption that's needed. So I'm moving in a direction now of creating a new platform and a new education curriculum. Uh, who knows where that will go in the future? Um, I'd love to create my own college, my own university, maybe, if I can get that stamp of approval from the, the people that probably won't want me to have it. But uh, in the meantime, I'll definitely be delivering more mainstream content for both adults and children because I believe that there needs to be this co-facilitation and I think it's a niche in the market I don't think that you can teach an adult something um you can teach an adult something but if they don't know how to effectively communicate to a child it's not going to be beneficial you can teach, teach a child something but if it's not enforced at home then it's not going to be you know habitualized habitualized I think that's why um it's not going to be a habit so there needs to be this sort of co-learning platform so we're we're providing a, uh we're going to be creating an alternative education platform. So that's the next step. And also, I mentioned I want to be a Hollywood actor, so I'm dip, dipping my toes in the water in that as well for a bit of fun. Yeah, I was going to ask you what next, but yeah, <laughs> we've got there. And I remember that in, in the the movie that was the well, actually, you know, I won't give give the line away for those. That yeah, 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 watch yeah. Because it, it's because it is it's it's it will really get you thinking. And, and you know, I've absolutely loved this conversation because it's been so nice to get to know you and meet you in person. I can feel that that sort of warmth and that energy coming through and, and the excitement for everything you're doing, which again runs very contrary to the headline of the psychopath mm. life coach, which again, I think is creating that juxtaposition that's going to bring a lot of people in your, into your world because they're going to be interested to see yeah. where it goes. And I think hopefully they're going to go on a similar journey to me and realize out the other side, actually this lad is just rocking up trying to make a difference. He's genuinely giving people a chance to change their lives, changing lives. And it's getting bigger, isn't it? You're leveraging your superpower if you want to look at it that way to just do good things in the world whether that be around the coaching organization which is giving this platform to potentially go into mainstream education and then hopefully sprinkle in a little bit of hollywood yeah to go along. <laughs> and you're only warming up that's the exciting bit yeah. so what is what is sort of beyond that or is that as far as we've, we've got at the moment um that's as far as we've got at the moment. I mean, the, the the next generation education platform, which is the goal, is is going to be a big one. You know, you know, if, if that works uh, the way that I want it to, not only could that be a billion dollar idea, but it could completely disrupt education across the world. So it's quite a large, ambitious target, um, but it's possible. So if I could just pull that one off, I think I'd be uh, pretty happy. And I think that's going to take me a bit of time. So <laughs> not quite sure what will happen after that. Maybe grandkids after that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can settle down at that stage. You can have a little rest, but you'll never rest, right? Because that's, you've got that energy that that you're always going to be on to the next thing and using yeah. and channeling, as I say, that energy in a really positive way. Um, Lewis, it's been an absolute pleasure to hang, spend some time with you today. Just in case people don't know, where can they find out more about what you do and connect and all yeah. those good things? Yeah, so lewis raymond taylor is my name and you can find me every everywhere with that name luckily i'm the only one in the world so i pop up everywhere uh instagram i'm most active so come and drop me a follow and say hey i like to connect with people the business is the coachingmasters.com um and of course the documentary which is on netflix is the psychopath life coach so if you want to really learn that story and see all the graphic images and, and a lot of the story which we didn't share today to be honest um 
go and check that out and, and see the full full cut and tell, and let me know what you think. Let me know if you Ooh. think I'm a psycho or not. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And I, my mind's definitely made up now anyway. In a good way. I, I'll just okay. uh, I'm sure everyone's going to go and check that out and get in contact with you. Lewis, you are a top man. Thank you for spending some time with me today. Thanks, mate. Thank you very much for having me.